I'll start this Q&A session with a few questions from myself and open it to the floor for the audience um, to ask theirs. So Zun Yan, uh, we know that 4x4 was commissioned by the Singapore Art Show in 2005. And to actualize this work, you actually purchased four primetime slots on the Arts uh, Central channel and broadcast it on national television. Um, we understand that 4x4 also took shape as a forum discussion and a foldable um, postcard cube for, for distribution. Um, can you tell us more about the genesis of this project, You know how you conceived of this work, and why you chose to present um, these four short films on television medium? Hi. Thank you for being here, and thanks for having me. So, um, to get to the question, um, <clears throat> yes, um, 4x4 was uh, essentially the second project um, I've made. So prior to that, I made a short film called Utama, Every Name in History is I, uh, which is here in the permanent collection for anyone who might be interested. Um, and I have had no, completely no training in film making whatsoever. So I, I made the first uh, film Utama just uh, with the help of friends who also had no experience in film, you know. So I was keen with the second project uh, to, to increase my budget, just so that I can see how professionals uh, work. You know. So that was partly my intention, that I wanted to see how professional cameramen and uh, ed editors work. So that was uh, sort of uh, my own uh, reason for doing so. Um, so we were essentially given a sum of money by the Singapore uh, um, Art Show and they were very kind. Um, they basically gave me a free hand to do whatever I wanted with that sum of money. And with that sum of money, it was just enough to buy uh, four prime time slots on Art Central, which not a lot of people were watching, so it wasn't that expensive. But the interesting thing is that if you buy the four slots, you and if I could persuade a production company to produce a series with me, there is a chance for me to sell the entire series to Art Central. Yeah, that was the way that um, they worked, right? So, and being able to sell the program to Art Central would increase my budget by four times. So, so, you know, you buy airtime in order to s sell the program to them, right? And with that, the profits would mean that my production budget increases by four times. So for me at the time as a young artist, this was something kind of interesting, you know, like this to, to I suppose, explore this shift in scale and to increase the possibilities of what you could do, you know, just technically with a uh, collaborate more getting more collaborators who are professionals etc yeah so all of that is the i would say the practical side of things you know and of course for me there was also an interest in thinking about the public and arts so at that time i was practicing as an artist but i was also kind of like pretending to be an art critic so i wrote um some art criticism, and I was engaging uh, quite a bit with some of the art historical writings of people like TK, Sabapati, etc. Right? And then I started wondering who actually reads this other than people in the arts, like, you know, all these incredible writings by Sabapati, right? Um, and ad amongst other people, you know, so I started thinking about this program as a way to not just present some Singaporean artworks through television, which theoretically reaches the widest possible audience in Singapore at that time, right? So this was 2005, and now, of course, nobody watches TV anymore, but, you know. So, but it was also a way to try to, um, like, disseminate this art historical intelligence, I would say, uh, from some of the writers that I was engaging with and whom I found interesting, right? So, so all of those goal, 
different aims kind of came together and that's essentially what led to this uh, choice to try to present the work on television. Right. So as a follow-up to that, can I ask if... Um what was the, did it have like a lasting impact on you? I mean, getting exposed to um, this kind of um, production making. Yeah, I would definitely say it, it was an incredible um, educational experience for myself to learn how people do things at the professional level. And, but I would say that for me, it was equally important to unlearn all of that <laughs> because uh, you know, the, the the way I would say the industry functions, you know, it, it has its own habits. And sometimes habits are there for a reason. They might be more efficient ways of doing things, but they also narrow the possibilities, I would say. So I think I always had this uh, relationship with like, I would say like professional um, I industry practices. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't... I try to be open to learn from it as much as possible. But I think that was there's always a part of me that also am conscious that I need to resist a lot of the habits and ready-made um, uh, kind of like ways in which, yeah, conventions, right? So, yeah, I think, you know, in, in that sense, uh, yes, you know, that was, yeah, I would say a big, big part of like what four times four meant to me yeah um even though uh four by four was presented as a television series it's distinct from some forms of mass media because of its critical reflections on interpretation by using the framework of polemical arguments between actors who play the role of the expert host interchangeably four by four makes it impossible to view each work passively and challenges viewers and hopefully our, our audience today um, to consider their own positions on them. So this was an experiment you carried out in 2005, which also marked one of the first instances the Art Central channel was used as a platform to present video art. Uh, 18 years on, what are your thoughts about the experience and putting television at the service of art education and criticism? Thank you for the question. Yeah, so when um, we were when I was making this project, I was uh, what interested me a lot was the conventions of like television. Um, so, for example, um, <laughs> there's a I would say there's a particular genre of television in which there's always a host or presenter figure, right? So uh, usually documentaries, and you have a. a, a presenter, for example, David Attenborough, you know, and he looks straight into the camera, you know, directly, his gaze is directed to the center of the lens, you know, which is something that if you were making a fiction film, you would avoid at all costs, right? Because that breaks this illusionary wall. But for these particular type of television programs, that's the mode of communication, which is that they look directly into the camera and they are addressing someone on the other side of this imaginary screen, you know. So that fascinated me a lot because I, I, I see that as a kind of um, authority. I would almost suggest a kind of authoritarian uh, a gesture where, where your gaze commands somebody's attention on the other side, right? But at the same time, it was also for me an interesting convention because there's actually no one on the other side of the camera. So these hosts, presenter figures, they are addressing essentially an imaginary being, you know. So conventions like that kind of like in interested me in, uh, you know, because for me there there is a kind of like political uh, dimension in, in the mode of address, like how we address each other, you know, and there's a, there is a kind of implied, I would say, hierarchy and power structure in that. So for me, Four times four, I would say, was a kind of early experiment in, in working through this type of um, 
subject positions and how power is implicated in these uh, subject positions, right? So that was something um, um, uh, critical for me. I mean, the other question, the other part of the project which interested me a lot was um, about dissemination. So for example, uh, because I suppose I'm a video artist, so our medium is uh, um, not no longer a physical object, right? So it's not a painting or sculpture, you know, it's uh, these days it's purely data, you know. And with that, there is always the possibility for extremely wide dissemination, you know, because these are forms or materials that are reproducible. Um, so with four, four times four, there was also that interest to like, kind of take the work out of the confines of the white cube and to insert it into these uh, channels of mass uh, distribution. Uh, I mean, this was before the internet, right, of course, so, yeah. So, and I think there were a number of uh, examples of figures uh, that interested me. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the work of Roberto Rossellini. He's like a, kind of the great Italian filmmaker and uh, pioneer of neorealism, right? But he kind of ended his career uh, by kind of almost stopping to make films entirely. And instead, he concentrated all his energies on like making television series, the television programs that were kind of didactic in nature. So he, he made like amazing uh, um, television programs on the French philosopher Descartes, uh, Pascal, uh, on the Medicis, and they were like amazing, you know. And for them, being able to like engage with television, there was a kind of utopian dimension, you know, that it was the medium of the, the, the mass medium of, of that era. So I think for me as well, you know, these were kind of like inspiring uh, examples. So I was... Um, also trying to make that experiment in Singapore. And of course, at that time, doing that in Singapore was not, it didn't seem, at some point, it, it didn't seem easy because our media is, uh, I would say, state controlled, you know. So there are all, all these kind of like constraints. So all the more it seemed to me interesting to try to experiment with how far we can insert ourselves in, into these machines, you know, and to use these machines for our own purposes. You like to challenge yourself, you'd say. <laughs> okay, um, in the current um, exhibition of CME CU, we see a new form of art in Southeast Asia that was created by its uh, pioneering artists who combine installation, performance, audio participation together with video. And, you know, 4x4 four four also encompasses video art, mass media intervention, cultural sleuthing, polemics, and pedagogy, demonstrating also an interdisciplinary approach, which you often employ in your practice. Um, could you tell us more about the application of video in your multimedia works? Thank you. Yeah, so I, I must confess I haven't seen 4x4 four four for a really long time myself, you know, but when I was watching it, it... it so uh, it was interesting for me to have seen it earlier. And um, so I also mentioned earlier that this was my second, um, kind of like basically my second art project. So this was the second time I engaged with like cameras and making- Very ambitious. Films. I just want to say for a yeah. second project, it's very ambitious. Thank you, yeah. But I think, you know, the roughness of course was also apparent, I think in the image, you know, and because being freed from all kinds of training and convention, <clears throat> there was also the desire to push like the technology, you know, and what was possible with our budget to the limit, right? And um, it, it, it never troubled me if the things look kind of raw, you know, and in fact, I found it interesting that it was so raw and it was like on national television. Um, but there were many things that we, you know, that interested me at a formal level, yeah, even with 4x4. Four four. So, for example, I would say the key thing, which is something I'm still interested, deeply interested in today, 
is what I would call compositing. Yeah. So, you know, just to maybe give a little bit of context, uh, I would say compositing is a, is a form of making an image by arranging layers in depth. You know? So, for example, if one is uh, making a painting, the word we use for it is uh, composition, you know, rather than compositing. So compositing, I would say, comes kind of out of the history of uh, maybe animation. So in early animation, which is two-dimensional animation, it, it's always done in layers, right? You have a foreground, uh, which is a figure, maybe an extreme foreground like a rock in front, and then you have the background. And these are separate layers, you know, and and then usually in what we call cell animation, which was invented by Walt Disney, you know, you have these layers and you have a camera on top, like filming all of these separate layers kind of combined into one, right? So um, in, when I'm looking, when I was looking at 4x4 uh, earlier, you know, it, it struck me very much that this kind of layering within the image is, is actually something I was uh, immensely fascinated with, right? So <coughs> these days we also call this kind of layering uh, like, you know, using chroma key technology. And today it's much easier to do this. But when I was uh, working uh, back then in 2005, it was uh, still quite a difficult process to, to have these kind of layerings uh, within the image. You know, so, um, yeah, and I would say that this uh, compositing, also for me, it, it gradually took on a, a kind of metaphoric uh, meaning for me, which is that for me, essentially, this is how I come to understand re reality or the received uh, reality, right? Uh, which is that it's, it's actually an image made up of many layers, you know, and we we see this image as one whole holistic total image, yeah. But actually, you can start to break the image up if you think about how it was constructed with each of these, uh, you know, layers, yeah. So I would say up to now, like a lot of the works I'm making are still, you know, it, it still has this kind of internal layering within the image, you know, so, yeah. And what would you say um, for you is the relation between um, film and video? Like, is, the, is it um, also like having to do with the staging, with the work? And I, I think um, in one of your past interviews, you mentioned this also idea of theatricality. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, film and video. I would say I, I was kind of uh, my generation would be the generation living through the twilight of film, which is the the end of the analog era, and and for me they are completely distinctive things. You know, a, a film it it, it captures an image by through a direct imprint of light. So uh, in semiology, we will call that uh, indexical print, you know, so an index, meaning that it's like a footprint on the sand, you know, the, the sign of the footprint basically means that someone was physically there, you know. So analog film, celluloid, it, when we say film, I would think, you know, I associate it with the celluloid, right? The negative. It's a direct, like, kind of imprint of light. But when, we, when it comes to the digital moment, which is what I, you know, which was how I began my practice, my first work, Utama, was already digital. Even though all of my influences and, the, you know, the, were cinematic, which is filmic, but of course it was impossible for me to afford using uh, film, you know, so we, we went into like, di uh, digital was the only way we could afford, right? But digital video is something completely different because it inscribes the image as a system of zeros and ones, as uh, data, you know, so I see them as completely, uh, almost completely different um, uh, technologies. So I would say that today, 
there are no longer any more films. There are only videos, you know, even things that you watch in the cinema today. Yeah, it's video because it uses digital technology. And even when the filmmaker tries to be very um, rigorous and sticks and insists on shooting on 35 mil, the moment it's finished, it's sent for post-production and it's sent for color grading, you know, and, and the film is already converted into into in, back into di the digital yeah zero one so when you are color correcting an image you could you 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 can basically isolate the image to its smallest unit and that's because of the digital um, the I guess the power of digital technology right which allows you to like isolate things to such a small degree so I would say in a sense all works. All films, all moving images now are videos. But I would even go one step further and to say that all films are essentially animations today. Because this process of being able to alter an image um, kind of in such small, um, at such a small scale, you know, the degree of control, the amount of like effects you can put on um, it, it makes actually all images much closer to the practice of animation, you know. And earlier I was talking about compositing, and of course compositing, I would say, is something closely related to the tradition of uh, animation, yeah. So, in fact, this has kind of like interested me a lot, like in, in just in thinking about these um, different types of medium and what they mean, you know. So I think... In my own practice, I gradually kind of moved further and further from film yeah, or the, the idea of the cinematic and into, into the digital and then into animation. So most of my works today, I would say, are kind of like animations. Right? Yeah. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Anyone want to ask? something while we have the artist uh, here. Everyone's still feeling a bit shy, maybe still thinking a lot about their own positions from watching 4x4. Uh, four four. Okay, while you continue to think about, you know, your uh, questions, I know I feel, I almost feel like I'm someone from the, like the 4x4, four four, but I'm addressing a real <laughs> A real audience, but I mean, like, uh, I mean, I'm interested um, what you were saying about um, uh, being influenced by animation. I mean, is it something that, I mean, have you ever been interested to make like an animation yourself? Um, ac actually, I started kind of uh, working purely with like anim, quite almost purely with animation since a few years. So a lot of my, yeah, not all of my recent works, but quite a number of them are animation. So I um, experimented with 3D animation and now I work a lot with 2D, 2D animation, which is uh, completely in this kind of flat uh, layers. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and I feel, I would say, very close to 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 the histories and the techniques of animation. It, it interests me much more greatly today, I would say, than these kind of lens-based uh, photographic arts, you know, which um, to me at least seems to have reached some kind of a limit to what we, we can do, you know, whereas uh, with, with animation, um, it, it seems like there's still quite a number of possibilities that we can explore, also because technology is, um, you know, like um, um, advancing all the time with these kind of image making processes. Yeah. I'm also curious, I mean, um, just going back to that idea also of like distribution and right when you made 4x4 four four and it was still. Um, television, right? People weren't so... I think YouTube was only founded like a year before that or maybe that same year. 
Um, have you experimented with distributing like through the through the internet? Um, yes. Uh, one of my you know, works, which is uh, produced in 2017, it's called The Critical Dictionary of Southeast Asia. So it's basically a film made up of uh, images that are stolen or <laughs> appropriated or borrowed from other online sources. And we created an algorithm which uh, is editing this film in real time. And this algorithm is also choosing between like different uh, possible uh, narrations to accompany this flow of images that it's putting together right uh, in real time. And this work is uh, it also has a it's uh, permanently located on a website, so anyone can assess it uh, at any time. So I'm still interested, there's still a part of like my practice where I'm interested with certain projects to give it like um, as wide uh, distribution as possible, you know. And sometimes it heartens me when I meet uh, some people, like uh, they could be like lecturers in the universities and they, and they tell me that they use the websites uh, for pedagogic uh, purposes. So, yeah, I would say, you know, I, I continue to have an interest in that. But of course, with the uh, the explosion of the internet and the YouTube after that, I think mass dissemination has also changed its meaning, you know, like what it means has also changed. Um, I'm not saying it's all negative, but we all know that the internet is full of, like, shall we say, like, you know, not really interesting or intelligent things, you know. And so we, we, we deal with the, it's a different situation today, you know. So, I mean, I'm not sure how exactly I would deal with it, but it, it was quite different, I would say, the situation in, like, you know, thinking about mass, uh, you know, getting out of the white cube and wet, you know, mass circulation back in 2005 with 4x4 four four and versus what we can do now with the internet, you know, yeah. So you say like back then it was more utopic, maybe? Um, I mean, at least for me, you know, in two, back in 2005, doing my second project, I would say the utopian um, impulse was certainly a big part of, of, of it, right? Like, um, for example, just like, uh, in the visual, like I was mainly known as a visual artist, but to be able to like uh, use the television and to work with, uh, you know, really uh, uh, amazing actors like Ketong, you know, Janice Ko, and uh, <coughs> who, who are kind of well-known figures on television and also in theatre, uh, was was certainly like very uh, was a great you know experience for me, but. Now that I mentioned the word theatre, I suddenly remember that was also part of your question. Like you were asking about theatricality, right? Maybe just to share, like, I don't know if anyone is interested in this, but um, <clears throat> back in that moment, I think theatricality was a word that I thought about a lot. Uh, mainly because of an American art critic whose name is Michael Fried. He wrote like amazing series of uh, art historical books. I think the first of these was called Absorption and Theatricality, you know. And uh, and this series of books uh, influenced me a lot. And now I do a terrible job of summarizing what he was talking about, right? So just to put it super simplistically, um, absorption for him, you know, when we engage with art, there are two modes. So the first mode is absorption. It's when you know we we are completely absorbed in a painting, for example, and we forget our surroundings. You know, so so you forget even, for example, the physical your own physical physicality, right? Because you are so absorbed. And the opposite of that was theatricality, which is that the work pushes you out from the image. And it makes you conscious of your own surroundings and your own body, 
Yeah. So Michael Fried, much as I like him, I would say he there's a, a sort of a dimension. He, he was in some sense an elite, uh, kind of high modernist, um, you know, critic. So for him, true art was absorption. So theatricality was not art because it, it forces you kind of back out into your own body, and and you become self conscious. So sometimes we say you are being theatrical. It's, it's usually not really a compliment, right? If someone says you are theatrical, it means that you are putting on an act and you are performing because you are conscious that you are being looked at. So, you know, you, you, you perform with your body, yeah. So, so this, regardless of what Michael Fried was thinking, what his own judgments on these were about. And, and his position, I must say, is a very com com complicated one. It can't be really reduced simplistically. But anyway, for me, these two concepts I've always found very interesting in uh, as a way of like structuring my own work. So I would say for me, the ideal work is one which both absorbs and also kind of repels, you know. So there are moments when you are absorbed and lost in the work, but there must be moments when the work kind of like pushes back so that you feel your own body and you are conscious and the work, and you recognize that the work is just a work, you know, you, you recognize it for what it is. So for me, it's important that a work of art contains a, a rhythmic, kind of movement between absorption and theatricality. So going back to what I said earlier about the host, the presenter, addressing the camera directly, one could think of that as a theatrical moment because you are acknowledging someone on the other side of the camera. You know, so that moment is a kind of a theatrical you know, moment. So this also kind of like explained my experiments in theatre and performing arts because around 2005, 2000, I can't remember which year exactly, I started working, creating some works on stage, for example, with Ketong as well as King Lear, you know, and uh, a lot of the actresses that I collaborated with and I started working on the, with the stage as well. And that practice continues today too. We have a question from the audience. Yes, oh. Thank you so much for um, sharing your thoughts as well as for the film, short films. I'm curious, the title of 4x4, four four, is it, um, how did you arrive at this number or is it because of pragmatic constraints like money? That's question one. Question two is, how do you select the artists that you um, want to kind of highlight? Because there are also so many, I mean, this may sound a bit provocative, but it's like all male artists, you know. Surely we have some female artists who um, who has perhaps a different lens that could be um, shared. So I'm curious how you shortlist your your artists. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So your about the yeah four by four first. Yeah, it was simply. I think it was a. Uh, it was simply that. We had four episodes and it was at over four weeks, you know, so four by four just seemed like a good, uh, for me at that time, a good title. And also, I think the second episode was dealing with Cho Chai Hyang's uh, five by five Singapore River. So that also kind of struck a note of resonance for me. So, yeah, so I just decided to call it four by four and... I had imagined that it might have been a catchy title that could help me gain more audience, but I'm not sure if it really worked. But uh, yeah, so that was the first. And thanks for the second uh, and very important uh, question, I must say. You know. Yeah, I, I would say that um, at that time in doing four times four and, and selecting this artist, there was also this conscious kind of like engagement with a certain kind of uh, canon that was in in the midst of formation. So for example, someone like Chong Su Ping was already canonized, right? And um, and of course, today, Dawu, I'm sure, you know, and deservedly so, it's very much uh, part of our canon, you know. And uh, Cho Chai Yang for me was 
um, kind of a very uh, in, in interesting uh, and important artist, I would say, um, kind of the conceptualist sort of mode of practice I, I saw kind of most fully embodied uh, in Chai's uh, pra practice. And Zaytran at that time, maybe up to now, is still a kind of, a, I would say, a, a controversial uh, figure, you know. So, but a lot of them were already sort of on the way to being a part of the canon, you know. So I think I chose them because for me there was a conscious kind of desire to to engage with these kind of like already existing uh, canon of like artists you know and um, but of course trying to do something different uh, with them at the same time and for me it was also kind of a dialogue with some of these uh, art historians and art critics who, who wrote most powerfully about these artists, right? So I mentioned TK Sabapati earlier, but also a dear friend, uh, Li Wing Choi, uh, art critic, who, who wrote, I would say, the most coherent body of criticism on Lim Zetun's work, you know? So in, in a sense, my choice was kind of dictated by this, uh, um, yeah, different factors, you know? Um, but the question, nevertheless, I would say is valid, I think, uh, today in l looking back at it and, and questioning the dominance of the, let's say, the males, right, within this canon. And, uh, but I think the National Gallery and uh, other, many other curators have been, I would say, um, kind of uh, expanding the canon, I would say, in the last decade. And, Getting us to relook, yeah. So you you two thousand and five. Now it's um you know a decade later or more. If given another chance, um, who would you choose? You know, or you know, are you gonna keep to the same same um um candidates for this canon? I mean, I hate the word as well, but I I know where you're getting yeah. uh, where you're at. You're, it's also a certain metrics in time and place at that point, at that point, as you say, they were emerging, some are very nascent. So if given another chance, who would you choose to engage? The, the answer I would give is that I would choose exactly the same artist, <laughs> knowing all the problems, uh, possible kind of like problems and questions, I would still have to affirm the choice and to repeat it. Yeah, it's, um, I, I don't know if you know like Nietzsche, and the uh, eternal return. So he says that, like, you know, the way to affirm your life is that you have to choose to affirm every single decision you have ever made again and again, no matter how many times you live through life. So, kind of a terrible thought. But I think, you know, there's still something interesting for me in going back uh, into engaging precisely with my choices made more than 10 years ago, you know. And, uh, yeah, I would say uh, I instead of possibly choosing a safer way out for myself, I would say I'm still interested to see what that means if I repeat these choices. Yeah. So, so, so I have to start asking about the details of your question. So I, I, I have to remake this series, but at this very moment with all available technology. Yeah. You know what? I think I will still force all the existing technology and if I have bigger budgets now, I will still force it to look exactly as low tech as it was 10 years ago. I don't know if you know like Gus Van San, the, the American filmmaker, he remade Psycho, which was uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. And it was a frame by frame reconstruction of uh, Psycho, you know. So if we repeat something, you know, and you repeat it like precisely the same way, then something interesting is going on. Some kind of a statement. I'm not exactly sure yet now what statement it is, but it is a statement of sorts. La. Yeah. So if, if I made it, look, if with my new technology and increased resources, and I made it look exactly like how it looked at that time, is it truly a repetition or, you know, like, 
And and actually, you know, along that line, something kind of very interesting as well is that actually, the only thing that can be repeated is difference. You know, like only there's only differentiation. Like if you try to do the same thing twice, it's never the same. You know, the very act of repeating it actually generates uh, difference. So then I think the work, yeah, it takes on a new... Yeah. Thanks for giving me idea for my next work. It will be easy. I don't have to write a script. You know, I just can repeat my own work. Yeah. You're currently, you know, working on a, on a new exhibition, right? Um, yeah, would you like to tell, like, our audience about it and like, invite them to come in and see it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks for the plug yeah so yeah i'm currently busy with uh, working on a show at the singapore art museum and the show is called time and the tiger and it's uh, i suppose it's framed by the museum as a mid-career survey so we are showing seven works that i've made uh, <coughs> over the years so one of the works um, is the cloud of unknowing and just to mention that because it was probably the last kind of lens based work I made, you know, where we were kind of like filming, uh, working with actors. Uh, and so it's an important work for me in many different levels. Uh, but it also showed, it is also going to showcase some of the works I made after. So other than some of the animation um, works that I kind of like mentioned today, um, I suppose another. It also showcases some of these works that I did, which are, I suppose one could call them found footage work, where I borrow or appropriate like, you know, images from other sources. Yeah. And also some of my works with uh, algorithmic uh, systems, you know, so that the film is being um, composed in real time, for example. Yeah. So it opens um, 24th of November. So... Uh, Please come if you are interested. Thank you. That's all the time we have for... Oh, wait, there's one, one more question. question. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you, Clarissa, for your very thoughtful questions. Mine are skewing towards more the quotidian. Uh, Zuyuan, thank you very much for making this. I'm very happy I caught this today uh, because I wasn't in Singapore at the time it came out. And... As a person who hasn't lived here for a long time, my question probably sounds a little unschooled and I'm a little out of touch. But even seeing it now today, I'm pleasantly surprised that you were bold enough to make such statements, you know, because growing up in Singapore in the 90s, I would never have dared to even think of seeing something like that. And so from what I recall of working in Singapore before 2005, I remember to air anything, put anything on air, you have to send it for censorship first. So first question would be, how did you get this cleared? You know, what were the administrative and logistical challenges, like you said, behind this piece of art? And the second question would be um, whether the lifting of, you know, the performance arts ban in 2003, which I didn't even realise was lifted, um, did it liberate you more to do this piece of work? I'm not sure how long the production process took. So if you would please enlighten us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. So yes, the work definitely had to be um, censored, but there are different types of censorship, right? Like, I mean, there is the censorship board, but I would say internal to the station, to Art Central itself, there is also a process where they would look at what you have done um, and give their approval or not. And I would say that my experience with uh, censorship, if we can call it that, I'm stretching the meaning of the word censorship, was much more with the, I must say, with the broadcast uh, station rather than the censors uh, out there, right? So just to give you an example of the kind of uh, uh, debates we kind of got into, so the very first episode was uh, Chong Su Ping's uh, tropical, uh, Dream of Tropical Life. Uh, on, uh, and most of the shots were kind of white shots. You, you see figures from the head to the leg, right? You know, so white shots. Lah. So 
after I finished the first episode, kind of the, and we showed them to the uh, station, the immediate feedback was that, oh, on television, you should never ever do wide shots. You should always do close-ups because the television is small and you want to attract people's attention like immediately. And the human face does that. But when you do it in wide shots, you lose you know, like you lose the attention, you know. So that was kind of the immediate, and I was requested to change the the work into, to remove the white shots and to zoom in. But I made up some excuse that it was technically not possible, but it, it actually was. So that became the process of how I dealt with uh, Arts Central. And, uh, and I think you are supposed to deliver the work prior to the broadcast time, and I must say that after the first episode, I began to deliver the, epi the, the subsequent episodes later and later. So almost one hour before the airtime was kind of how I would um, stretch it, you know. So this also explains probably why that was the last television series <laughs> I've ever made, you know. And uh, so it was, uh, it was that kind of game where one has to... Yeah, you have to decide if you would live with the consequences and, you know, do these experiments. Like, and at that time, I thought that was the way for me. But if I have to relive my life and repeat, I would do the same today as well, you know. And uh, yeah, so that that was actually, you know, the, the process. And there, there were many other comments, some of which I think I should not even uh, re reproduce here you know but a lot of it had to do with their notions of um, what attracted audience and what doesn't you know so cr critical they were not even so much disturbed by the contents of the critique but rather the fact that people were just like talking so much you know that was kind of the bigger problem uh, and I found that that was kind of the bit that I needed to ne negotiate um, the most. Um, but, I mean, I say this now in hindsight, and I kind of don't, there's like no ill will whatsoever. It's, it was part of the game that I signed up for. You know, it's uh, in order to, to leave, leave the safe haven of the white cube, which is a safe space, even though you only might have 500 audience after putting up the work for one month, you know. If you want to leave the sanctuary of the white cube and you want to enter into these systems of mass distribution, you know, you, this is the price you one has to pay or the game that you have to play. So I kind of saw that very much as part of the work, and it was also a kind of testing to see how far I can go, uh, what kind of discourses I could push, like you know, like um, onto television, you know. So, yeah, in Singapore we always say O B was it O B Marcus was it? Yeah. So so for me, I guess I was in you know I didn't know where these boundaries were, and so I was kind of like just pushing it to the limit but also I didn't want the work to suffer by being uh, removed you know so you I guess I had to try to be strategic as well in like maneuvering um, around it so I saw all of that as part of the work it's, it's for me as much the work as these four videos that you see so for me, actually, pro the processes of negotiation is extremely important. And I would say this is the big influence, one could say, that Lim Zay Chun, the, the fourth artist, had on me. Because for me, the way I understood his practice was that it was actually just all about these negotiation and processes. So for me, that was also part of the work. Like the, the resistance to you... Um uh, to your work was actually coming from, you know, wanting it to conform to television standards, yeah, more than the content that was being um, discussed. Uh, 
I think with contents, um, I, I suppose sometimes I get asked these questions because I make certain, a few of my works are deemed to be kind of like political, you know, whatever that means. Uh, so sometimes I'm asked that question. And I think for me, there are also ways to push in that direction if if you if you do it strategically you know like uh, so so for me you know these lines are never like fixed like uh, you know on the ground you know it's uh, these lines can shift and i see it very much as uh, kind of the for me at least like the role of an artist uh, is to test these boundaries and to try to f invent small little ways to to push things through or to escape if it's necessary. Yeah, but especially within our context uh, and uh, within the context of our specific kind of political systems, I think these kinds of experiments are very important. I would say. So we hope you'll um, go visit Hoots Union's um, exhibition at Singapore Art Museum opening November, November 24th. November 24th. And please catch the See Me, See You early video installation of Southeast Asia exhibition, which is open now. So you can um, go, go visit it um, after the screening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>